Welcome to my next caring conversation. My guest today is Mavusam Saman, who hardly needs much introduction as somebody in South African politics who has been one of the leading spokespeople calling for an ethical accountability for the governing party, the ANC. Someone who has got very deep roots going back to the 60s in the ANC, in its struggle. And I'm not going to say too much about him because I want you to go and listen to a very interesting podcast which Nicholas Claude has done with Mavusa just a couple of weeks ago in his Voices from South Africa series. And it's an hour long. And on that podcast series, you will see lots of other very interesting interviews. His daughter, Sazon Kim Samang's there, Ronnie Casserals, Kevin Bloom. It's been a great pleasure to have got to know Mavusa over the last six months only. Can I start at a lighter note? I've been highly amused when we were talking when there was that whole issue that President Ramaphosa's son was in trouble. And I think you made the comment where you said, oh, it seems like the sins of the sons are going to be visited on their fathers from one, <laughs> from one generation to the next. Now, does the same thing apply in reverse? Do the virtues of your daughter get inherited to the parents as well? I'm, I'm, I'm told sometimes that uh, some of her genes happen to have come my way. Uh, <laughs> this is said by people who think I try to write uh, but nothing like uh, how she does it. So they, they, um, they, they credit me with having picked up some of her genes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, if I may declare my own desire to actually see that book written, is that uh, the next step would be to have it turned into a film hmm. and then to get the obvious person to play Mavusam Samang would be Morgan Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> And one of my other good friends uh, had said when he had met you when you were still with Sandpox, yeah. he felt like he was in the presence of somebody who just exuded a certain confidence, a certain integrity, and a certain sense of a presence that mm. was, without you even opening your mouth or saying much, somehow gave people hope and inspiration. And I've experienced now what that means. But how does that feel for you? I mean, and where did it come from for you? Well, it's it? very, very humbling. I mean, it's, uh, I, I'm not aware that mm -hmm. that's how I impact people. But it's, it's nice to, mm -hmm. to think that people have got that impression of me. I have grown up from um, not very humble beginnings by African standards, but I think I grew up in households where humility was really primary. Mm. Um, you just did not go around whatever your achievements which would be celebrated. You, you did not go around saying, I did this, I did that. Uh, mm. you, we grew up uh, with a sense of uh, doing things together, doing things with people, mm. uh, doing things really for other people. Mm. We were aware of the privileged situation in which we were as children. Mm. Mm. My grandfather had a big farm in uh, Newcastle uh, because he's part of the group that uh, bought land in 18, uh, I mean our family, mm. uh, 1890 something, 1880s. And so when he went to, the, to, to Massendale, our house stood out a uh, little larger than other people's houses. Mm. It's not as if there was so much poverty, but we were distinctly a little better off than the others, but never once would my grandfather allow that to sink into our little mm. heads. It's still very much a <coughs> communalism rather than a competitive materialism. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. That's, uh, mm. that's, that's the spirit in which we grew up. And by the way, as a matter of interest, uh, my grandfather was neighbors with a, a, a white farmer, an Afrikaner farmer. The children in that household treated my grandfather as their grandpa and said yeah. grandpa. So there was this relationship, I'm talking mm. now the 50s and yes. late 1940s, where we would visit. Uh, mm. And we didn't quite, uh, we knew white people were crazy, were running the country. But that man's relationship mm. with my grandfather defined also 
my relationship with normal people, so wow. respect regardless of their color. And that's the tragedy is that apartheid sort of decided that development could only happen if it was separate. My grandfather was very clear about not accepting apartheid. In fact, when uh, they introduced Bantu education, mm. um, some people from the department, now that I think I know of native affairs, came to say, you're now going to learn in your own languages. Uh, and this is such a wonderful thing. The English mm. in England speak English and so on. Wouldn't you want to be to be to be that? What's the importance of uh, English? Wouldn't you want your children to be mm. to be like that? Mm. My grandfather raised his hand. I said, "I understand your daughter uh, studies in England right now. So how can you tell me that it's not good for me to want my children to study other languages and go mm. to England also if mm. they feel that? Because mm. you are now telling us that we must study in Zulu." You know, that kind of, mm, uh, mm. and it was considered a very chicken native <laughs> <laughs> for doing that. Well, moving to the present, and yeah. let's move to what in fact is today's headlines. The ANC-NEC has just met, and ETOLs. Now, there was a resolution which came out that said that um, they, they would like, what did they use, an expedited solution <laughs> to the ETOL story. I think it was five, five or so years ago, I remember reading a Daily Maverick article, an opinionista piece, in which you talked of how you, in your local ANC branch at Lily's Leaf, That's right, had, invited, had invited Nazir Ali, the CEO yeah, of Sandal, yeah, to yeah, come yeah. and explain. Yeah. And how you just you know, asked him questions, which he really wasn't able to satisfy you with his answers. And now we are five years or so later with a system that's simply not working. What would an expedited solution look like? I really don't know what they should do right now, but <clears throat> the beginning of the ETOL system was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think the ANC is in a real dilemma as to mm -hmm. how to finance this. The first article that I ever wrote mm -hmm. uh, to the media was when Jacob Zuma said, he didn't pay for, he didn't ask for these things that were supplied to him at Ingandla, um, the remedial uh, mm. action articles, uh, and therefore he wasn't going to pay for them. In mm. that article I said, you know, when I was the CEO of uh, the state IT agency, mm. the police determined that I needed security. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of corruption and I was taking pretty hard action dealing with that. And they came to... Uh, wire my house with a fence in my house and it cost quite a bit of money. I was living in Midrand and so the yard was big. Come mm. the auditors at the end of the year. They said, Mr. Msimang, policy here says if there is any additional value put on your asset, uh, then you have to pay for it. And I said, ah, you know, I ended up paying for that. And I lived in comfort in my house in, uh, in, in Midrand. So perhaps the president who is in a similar predicament, being given something that he didn't ask for, if it's of value, you might as well pay for it. Mm -hmm. That's how we started the engagement mm. uh, with, uh, <laughs> with Zoom. And of course, I was working for Arta and we, we amplified that message left, right and center because it showed this contradiction that existed within the political sphere right. where there was simply no integrity in the ANC as a governing party and as a consequence, there was no legitimacy in the state in seeking to basically get people to cooperate. Because no, there is absolutely no doubt. There came a time uh, in the life of our government post-1994 when they really became very disdainful about uh, the people, about consulting. Mm. The, the people really didn't matter, to, to be very honest with you. Mm. Um, maybe because the ANC had, was such a popular um, mm. uh, party, organization, um, the, the, the cult of entitlement produced mm. arrogance. Mm. And really, you saw this in very many places where government was mm. derelict in its duties, whether it was the people protesting uh, because of poor service delivery, it was almost as if, uh, who, who are they 
this is how it's going to be. Mm. And there was no action taken against people who were responsible for this. And this is how this corruption starts growing. You, mm. you know, if I recall, it was most evident in the municipalities mm. when this thing, we, some people thought in national, provincial government, maybe things were not so bad. Of course, mm. we didn't know. But you had an ANC that was that had won a, a very strong uh, majority and, and, mm. and had the confidence of the people who believed that working with the people, with NGOs, who were, by the way, soon forgotten, they became mm. the enemy. <laughs> um, there mm. would be that process of consulting, mm. the process of wanting to find out how mm. things should be done, the money is paid by taxpayers and it's available to assist the poorer. Uh, in the, the primary aim of the taxation should be for the liberation movement anyway, to see uh, to the provision of the basic needs of the poorer mm. sections of mm. our uh, uh, society. Mm. Mm. So I think we did develop a sense of uh, impunity, mm. a sense of serious mm. shameful disregard uh, mm. for the common person, the prioritization of the budget mm. was no longer for the provision mm. of water, sanitation, mm. of uh, well-run hospitals, mm. uh, of proper education, mm. pit latrines, all those things, they were, the provision of things mm. that were considered basic kept on just being postponed. I mean, I said to Naza Ali, I said, look, you know, if if some of the money mm. that I was paying for my e-tolls as a privileged urban dweller in Joburg was going to cross-subsidise okay. health services and road services in the rural areas of Ponderland where I work, well, then I wouldn't have had a problem with it. He told me, he said, no, it's all ring-fenced. It can't be used there. And, and, and that's really where I started to become suspicious that there was more than just ag arrogance because one of my spiritual mentors, Richard Raw, says... When arrogance combines with ignorance, that's when as things start becoming diabolical. Yeah. That's when it really becomes oppressive. And my concern now, let us now move from the urban to the rural communities and to, to look at the whole question now of the traditional oh, Khoisan, oh, traditional oh, Ijebo. Oh, oh. I have not attended many meetings. I can count them in one hand, which consisted of people who were so knowledgeable mm. about their subject, uh, who were so humble in uh, telling their stories. You had a group of people who were authorities in the subject mm. matters that they dealt with. It, mm. it was most humbling. You know, you are talking about the former Bantu stands, mm. mostly, lands which are classified as communal, or state land, land that is under traditional leaders. Mm -hmm. There was one gentleman yesterday, a true traditional leader, who spoke for the people, who spoke on issues. Uh, my name is Shirami Sherinda. I'm, I'm a lawyer and a researcher. So I'm a legal researcher. I'm working with the Legal Resources Center. I'm also a chairperson. Of a, of a royal castle, it's a family royal castle. So my great grandfather, it's, it's, it's got a, was was a traditional leader, and the village where I stay, it's named after him. So he got this traditional leadership customarily. <coughs> my role in the royal family uh, is like I'm a chairperson. This chairmanship I got it from the aunt and the uncles. The reason they chose me to be in that position is when we're gathering as a family of a traditional leader. So they realized that uh, uh, I've studied law and I've grown up in that family seeing everything happening, how things are done. So the new traditional leader who's there is the, the, my son, is the son of my brother. It's young and he's not educated. Uh, the government now is trying to give these people powers which they never had in terms of custom, uh, which powers in the democratic situation, the powers are not necessary, of which South Africa is one. So uh, such a law, 
I, I think it's unconstitutional by just look, looking at that South Africa is one, and we have courts for rural people and courts for urban people. That's very wrong, the way I see it. The interpretation there is wrong. So they want these chiefs to be presiding officers when they've not studied an interpretation of statute. They should be first taken to, to school for four years to study LNB. Uh, it's then that they will be able to, to be presiding officers. Otherwise, this bill should not pass. Thank you. You have people who are called traditional leaders who are actually put in such places by the apartheid regime. Mm -hmm. We are actually propping up a, a structure that was set up to oppress black people that the ANC opposed so strongly in the 50s. Uh, yeah. This is what I think many people in government today do not realize. When they this rush of bills about traditional leadership, communal lands and all mm -hmm. of that, I, I don't really quite understand. Let me not impute a motive too early for why they do that. But the impact of that is that they are really disenfranchising so many people. I think it's about 18 million people who are said to live in these areas. And they are fundamental rights which are protected in the Constitution are being taken away and given to people who are called their representatives mm. who do not even bother to consult mm. them. So I'm from Northwest mm. and our land is also one of the targets of mining because yes. they're mining diamonds from our land and we don't have a say and we need to give consent and there's actually a private land that was bought by our forefathers. So the chiefs it is also a part of the, the government friends that are doing all these activities. And last week when I went to the public hearing <coughs> at the legislature, the chiefs were guaranteed by the speaker of speakers of Northwest that they shouldn't worry because they're, gonna, they're going to sign deals because the president is going to sign the, the TKLB mm -hmm. and they, they're going to get allowance to sign the deals with, mm -hmm. with mining companies or whoever wanted to do business with them and they're going to be paid and they shouldn't worry and their traditional council will also get going to get paid. And we've seen the lady we've just listened to now, she attends meetings and the chief is so so rough. In fact, people risk their lives when they raise issues of their rights mm. as, uh, as, as, as citizens, but mm. also as owners of the land where um, chiefs have been given jurisdiction mm. to enter into arrangements with other people mm. uh, and, and take absolutely no cognizance of mm. the interests of the rest of the population. It is about empowering traditional leaders to engage with third party agreements with other players without having to go through the proper processes of their customary law. Is that how you understand it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The customary law is not, it's, all, it's observed in the breach. Mm -hmm. Two more things. I learned yesterday that people are already acting as if these bills have been passed in their acts. Mm -hmm. The traditional uh, leaders mm. are acting as if they've been given mm. these powers that mm. South Africans must be really alert and not allow them to be given. Yeah, and I actually tried to query and he said that it's a done deal, no one can say anything. Well, were there any dissenting voice? Yeah. Were there any people questioning that? I was the only one Anyone? questioning. Really? Gosh, how did that feel? I, I felt very disappointed and I, I, was, I was very angry. I couldn't even sleep. Did they listen to you? I mean, did they give you... No, they you didn't. And they, they, they said to me, if I've got complaints, they'll, they'll give me the, the, the forms to fill. And they said I must give, give them my email address. I gave it to them. But up till today, I never got it because they know I always, when there's public hearings, I always make submissions. And all my submissions are always against what they, they want to do. The second thing, really, is... Um uh, if the politicians go forward and, mm. and, and pass these bills and make them laws, uh, you'd be acting unconstitutionally. Mm. The rights that you and I and any other person sitting away from these places enjoy will mm. be denied 
uh, these mm. people. I do like the definition of uh, a communal uh, lens, uh, mm. the description. Uh, mm. I think the interim prevention of uh, pr protection. Yeah, interim protection of, of, inf of uh, informal, informal Land Rights Act. Yeah. Is very clear about, mm. about the mm. people's mm. relationship to the land. Mm. The land is theirs, yeah. mm. held in trust by others, but it's theirs. They were born, you know, the, the, their ancestry, mm. I, I, you know, uh, is associated with that land. Mm. And, and because of colonialism and after colonialism, because mm. we now took these lands and call them state lands, we have effectively deprived people of their of the right to their own land. Exactly. By the way, I'm going to be having uh, all those presentations, so we'll be putting them up on YouTube so that people can experience some of that wisdom that you saw. But to get down to what is quite interesting, we are encouraged on the one hand by the Presidential Land Commission, which has no. endorsed the Maledi judgment and yeah. the Baleni judgment, which is about Kolobeni, yes. affirming the right under Apura to pry free and informed consent before there can be any deprivation of land rights. So we at least have got that. On the other hand, we know that Minister Greta Mantashe is very uncomfortable with the thought that rural communities can veto the award of mining rights. And we have seen also in Ponderland, but in the Western Ponderland Kingdom, that story which broke earlier this year, yes. in which we found that there was a deal being struck by the king of Indomase yes. with a Chinese company that would have turned 30 kilometers of pristine coastal area into a Disney playground where the king would be paid a million rands a year to remove the people. Mm. Now, this was like straight out of the apartheid copybook, it would seem. There is the assumption being made that President Ramaphosa's hand is Just hovering ready. over yeah. to sign off on the Khoisan Traditional Leadership Bill. Is it so dangerously imminent? You know, my concern, that's a big concern, is that if I was as ignorant as I was about these issues, say, a year ago, how many more South Africans are unaware of the disenfranchisement, the, what do you say about when you take away citizenship, uh, of so many people, so many South Africans. Really, the number is given at about 17, 18 million, so, which means 40 million mm. South Africans really don't understand what is going on in in rural areas mm. and you, you're talking about the constitution mm. i want to talk about the anc we as we are the party that brought about liberation at least that played a leading role mm. the leading role uh, mm. in bringing about uh, liberation to this country otherwise you would not have been in government successively mm. up to today although our performance of course is causing us to lose quite a, mm. quite a bit of that confidence. How does an ANC government, mm. which came to power mm. to liberate people from poverty, suddenly become unaware that 18 million people mm. are being robbed, uh, they're subjected to daylight robbery. robbery. We, we already have the you know, the color, the, the, the color of anything is being resisted by the people and one must really congratulate them for their courage mm. and so on. Gwere Mantashe should have, in the first instance, found out whether mining was viable or his predecessors mm. should have. I think this whole noise mm. about whether mining or agriculture mm. or or anything else should be done, would have been quietened by the fact that it is totally unsuitable. It's, mm. it's really not viable mm. to mine there. Mm. Uh, because, uh, you know, we've got global warming these days, you've got dunes there, which would mm. invariably mm. be disturbed by the mining that would take place. So not only are you dis 
destroying the lives of mm. the people and their livelihood. You're destroying nature. Mm. You're inviting upon this nation uh, consequences that uh, destroying mm. the ecosystem. Mm. So, so, so everything is wrong about the approach. Mm. I understand the Department of uh, Mineral uh, Resources has got a section that deals with EIAs, mm. you know, environmental impact assessment. Mm. When you have got the leadership that is so conflicted in terms mm. of its interest, you can be mm. sure that that EIA is going mm. to be interfered with. Mm. One of the things that needs to be done is to take that EIA mm. out and assign it to the Department mm. of Environmental Affairs. Mm. That's their natural place. Well, let me you just in interrupt you there, Mavusa, because you made the comment about EIAs, and obviously you having worked for sand parks all those years, you've got a deep passion for the environment. Mm. Uh, comments that were made by the, uh, what was then called the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism on the 2007 mining rights application. Unfortunately, Greta Montasha himself seems not to want to know this. Yeah. The mining rights were suspended in 2008 and revoked in 2011, largely because the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism had found exactly what you're well, saying. Well. They said, how can you have a 25-year year lifespan of a project that's going to destroy the environment up against a economic activity that had no destruction on the environment, which conserved it, which would have been tourism? But what happened here, and this is really where I think things become very ominous, is that in 2010, yeah, there was a change of policy whereby the Department of Environmental Affairs was basically subordinated to the Department of Mineral Resources. I didn't know this. They got oh my God. the authority to approve EIAs. And that one environmental system, is what it's called, is in fact currently in place. And that, for me, is putting the fox in charge of the hen house. Absolutely, absolutely. Is that not part and parcel of what state capture was all about too? It's no exaggeration at all that this is an aspect, that's uh, an aspect of state capture, absolutely. You've got these mining companies who will make enormous amounts of money and who do they bribe, if mm. you will? Some local people, maybe BE, uh, uh, who would get some shares mm. and it, it runs into millions and if it's mm. a big project it could even be billions. Forgotten completely are the communities whose lifestyle will be changed because I think in, the, in, in Kolobeni they would have to move mm. uh, away from the The owners are the people. That mm. Interim Protection Act makes mm. it absolutely clear, makes clear what all of us should know that those people have all the rights mm. to, to, to a life on that land and also to the use of that mm. land. Mm. The informed consent is a wonderful provision. Mm. So whatever is being done about these bills that we're talking about, mm. we, we need to make sure that the people mm. are not just consulted, as you indicated earlier, and that, they're, and that the informed Mm. is based on a real mm. understanding mm. of the people, neutral mm. people who have the interests of the people at heart mm. should be allowed to consult the community, mm. educate, uh, educate mm. them on things that they may not be aware mm. of. They are already very well educated. I was <laughs> impressed yesterday. Mm. But to say the, the implications, to understand the implications of uh, Mm. any intervention, whether it's mining or, mm. or, or developments and so on. You well traveled, you worked for the United Nations system for a period, you've been in many different countries. Mm. I want to ask you a question I've been asking rhetorically for the Minister Gwede Mantashe to the mining company in Australia and to academics. Have you come across any case study where a rural community that of equivalence to the Kolobeni Amadiba community, have been removed from their land to make way for an open cast mining operation mm -hmm. that have been left with a better collective quality of life as a result of that. I mean, have you come across that? Short answer is absolutely not. Well, Nothing I've asked whatsoever. that question too. Yeah, and I mean, no. when the mining company yeah. puts out its propaganda, yeah. Yeah. it talks as if this is going to be the saviors of the people. 
And it's and of course when I point this thing out to them, their response to me is not to provide a good case study, as I would have thought any person of integrity would be. They put a slap suit on me and they start sort of suing me for defamation, for, well, for discrediting right. them. I mean, Don't we have this uh, recent case of uh, Kulubuse Zuma mm. and um, some other person related to Mandela mm. um, going in, mining, messing things up? Mm. You, you know, you, you can't leave the earth gaping with, uh, with, yeah. with holes, you're supposed to... Um, be rehabilitation. To rehabilitate, that's the yeah. word I'm looking for. There, yeah. There's no rehabilitation. So, but that's a constant problem. I am associated a little bit with uh, a, a, mm. a mining company, uh, mm. and, and I know the budget, you, you have to have in your budget many millions of mm. rand set mm. aside for rehabilitation mm -hmm. when uh, the mine comes to... Mm end of life. These are things that are so easy to overlook and ignore. Mm. And once you have dug that hole and you have no money, the money is not there. Mm. Uh, the most that the government could do is to deprive you of your license that you no longer need anyway or put you in jail. And mm. these people always have money to do that. Mm. But the harm that is done mm. to the environment, mm. and in this particular case, to people's property who mm. don't even benefit mm. uh, to any significant uh, yeah. appreciable extent from these activities. You are really importing foreigners in this sense. We are foreigners. Yeah. We are foreigners to that land. Mm. <laughs> you know, I ran, uh, we, we ran a project in Isimangaliso mm. uh, and we had a BEE component and, and I support it and still support BEE. But we defined our BE mm. as people who live within the park area, mm. in so in St. Lucia there. Mm. And you wouldn't mm. get a Mavuso coming from Johannesburg to say, I'm black mm. and I'm entitled to that. We stick. So you, mm. in this case of these mining companies and most mm. of the other projects, the people who should be the BE, so to say, are like completely a... excluded. Mm. And you get strange people coming from other places. And, yes. and where the money is even set aside, no one is auditing it mm. to ensure that the money, little money that is set mm. aside for the community is in fact. Now getting back to these Bantustan bills. Yes, yes. I wonder if it's a misnomer <clears throat> and why we shouldn't just turn them what I see them to be state capture bills. Now, if I may explain what I mean there, is that in, our minerals on, are in the custodianship of the state. In order to get hold of them, you capture the Department of Mineral Resources. But, the, but these minerals <coughs> are under the ground in these areas of the former homeland areas, yes, yes. largely. So how do you get access to them and get the people out of the way? The whole idea of using the traditional leadership system manipulating it yeah. in defiance of customary law, in defiance of the Constitutional Bill of Rights, and thinking that you can empower these chiefs uh, to basically sign these third-party agreements as we saw happen. Is that not state capture? Is it not a pernicious way in which you don't just simply seek to corrupt people, you seek to systemically uh, set up an infrastructure yeah. that actually enables those with and power and money to basically get their hands on those minerals yeah. in the easiest way possible. Way. I think this thing needs to be taken up with the Zondo Commission. That's what we have. Because of the manner in which it is implemented, I don't personally see anything wrong if you had minerals under the ground that would assist the community and the country uh, develop things of mm -hmm. interest to them. That, that you would have the Department of Mineral, uh, DMR, Mineral mm. Resources, entrusted as the sovereign representative in accessing this wealth. What should be revised completely is defining the beneficiaries mm. of, of this thing, of uh, mm. such, such wealth. Yes, it must be South African. I'm still in favor of well, that mm. is found in some part of South Africa, being distributed, mm. or being made available, the process of mm. that wealth being made available to other South Africans mm. who are less fortunate who may not be. Mm. But 
the, you, you can't do it at the expense mm. of the people in whose land these things mm. are found. Mm. Uh, I, I just want to make that Absolutely, point clear. Yes. That uh, I, I think for me, you would say uh, part of the condition of the license is that you should do things mm. that are required to be done there, mm. by the way. Mm. Not from profits later, but it's part of your, mm. <laughs> it's part of your co capital thing mm. that uh, mm. there must be road infrastructure, there must be provision of water and so on. It can be defined. It's not, they will mm. still make money. They'll mm. still make huge profits. Mm. Maybe some of the mm. money that goes to other shareholders mm. uh, who, mm. whose, whose credentials are really mm. Uh, mm. doubtful should be directed at making mm. sure that communities in which uh, on whose on whose land mm. minerals are are mm. found mm. Uh, should be uh, clearly un mm. undoubtedly they must be beneficiaries of that mm. not to mm. the exclusion of other South Africans mm. but mm. as things stand now you're absolutely right this is veritable state capture it, it really mm. is you have mm. a department right now acting more in the interest of the mining companies mm. because they believe that the revenue is going to mm. assist our GDP and all those nice terms mm. that are used. And the, the people of, of least concern are the people on whose mm. land this thing. I want us to keep on going back mm. to it's their land, mm. even if it's not formally so. Mm. I think because the, this thing has continued for so long mm. and, and I, I really don't know how an ANC government would be ignorant of the mm. tremendous disadvantage, mm. not just disadvantage, disempowerment mm. of people mm. that should go on for this thing. Mm. It's a matter that's reportable to Zondo. And, and, mm. and you will find if you go mm. to that uh, Corruption mm. Watch commissioned a report on yes. Uh, yes. activities in mining. And what's what's happening there is frightening. It billions being sent it, it, it's offshore billions, through it, these corrupted trusts, uh, uh, traditional uh, leaders basically being milked and taken over. That the Zona Commission's brief is not just simply to kind of find out what happened, but how yeah. do we fireproof the state? Yes. For the future. Yes. How do we make sure that there are proper checks and balances? Yes. Well, yes. the first thing that has to go is this one environmental system whereby the Department of Resources approves EIAs. Yes. Yeah. Then these, these bills must be, be kind of dumped, and we need to have legislation that is truly in the spirit of the Constitution, of ensuring that there's accountability, transparency, uh, in terms of what the Bill of Rights, Section 25 particularly, land yes, rights, yes, yes. and Section 24, the environmental rights, the benefit of future generations that need to be considered. You summarize a lot better than I could, <laughs> but really, any yeah. of these bills, mm. you cannot pass, we should not pass any bill that is unconstitutional, That's right. that violates the Constitution. Mm. and. When you look at Section 24 of the traditional Khoisan thing, you, you can see right straight away it advocates a breach of the constitution, yes. constitutional rights of the people. Mm. So I think, you know, the veterans, uh, and I belong to ANC veterans, mm. uh, who have been very worried about the number of aspects of governance in this country by the ANC, our, mm. our party, have mm. actually uh, mm. requested that uh, we, we mount a lobby, a strong mm. lobby, against these bills. Mm. Uh, we tried to, 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 to intervene with, uh, with the MPs mm. before these bills went to Parliament, and, and we didn't succeed. Parliament passed mm. that, and it, it went to the NCOP, mm. certainly the traditional uh, mm. Khoisan one. I, it was almost snuck into mm. there. And before anybody realized, the NCOP had already approved it. Mm. The last chance we have, not to save the people on the, but to save the ANC, to save this country, <laughs> is to ask the president to make sure that before he signs this bill, he checks with the Constitutional Court, the mm. judges yeah, of the so, Constitutional Court. So he gets Court. It vetted by them. Yes. Absolutely. The, this has to be vetted. Any of these bills should not be allowed through mm. 
unless it's been they have been vetted by the constitutional court. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And now, I do, do you think he will? It will uh, we hope to we, we hope we hope to convince you know, him to do that. I I don't know how uh, of faith he is about the things that we're talking about. He mm. should be. I respect him. I'm sure. But mm. you, you've got a whole party that's really been galloping forward with these bills and quite a, a clutch of them. Mm. And and you say to them, what's the big deal? Has the ANC become lazy mm. to talk to people? This is a mm. people's organization yes. and are now relying on mm. traditional leaders, perhaps who are members of Contra Lessa, yeah. and they don't and they believe that the Contra Lessa leaders all have mm. legitimate uh, influence and power mm. over the people. Yeah. Uh, they, if they say vote for, for ANC, then mm. the people will vote for the ANC. I mean, yeah. if the ANC went down to have conversations that we had yesterday with the people in their own areas, they would discover the truth that we have. They mm. don't have to get it through people, mm. some of whom, I yeah. say respectfully, <laughs> have been installed. Uh, through the yeah. apartheid system. Yes, yes, yes. So it, it, the, the president, I mean, we will work hard. We will mm. drive very hard mm. to make him aware that the ANC will sink even deeper mm. into trouble if it now alienates people in exactly. rural areas, yeah. when in urban areas people are already moving away from us because yeah. of the corruption levels that we still yeah. So it's in the political to interest for it's ANC it, to take over. It's a popular absolutely. issue. It's an issue that really affects your constituency directly. And the last thing you want to do is to be betraying the struggle. I mean, even if the president does sign it into law, we will, I presume you will go to court and you will win. Oh, yes. So we're going to win in court. When I put that to Alinka, she That's said... You know, unfortunately... Um, the previous Minister of Rural Development, Gorgile and Quinty, mm -hmm. said to my colleague Ben Cousins at, at LAS, he said to him, you'll win in the courts, but we're winning on the ground. And they are, because they actually are, all of these mining deals are extra legal, mm -hmm. and yet they've, they've gone ahead with them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're putting police into all the, all, all the royal households in the Eastern Cape. They've got a pilot project including that and Damasi and Damasi who signed that deal. So it's, you know, the, the, the kinds of abuses we're seeing by traditional leaders now are much more serious than those that we were seeing in 94. We have to do more than winning in court. Yes. We've got to win on the ground. And, she's, and, I, and what, what guidance, what thoughts and proposals do you have of how we can percolate this thing through? How do we get the story told in such a way that it does identify with You know, people? I'm betraying my bias now. Mm. As an ANC person, I really wish we should start avoiding losing cases in court. It's mm. embarrassing. Mm -hmm. So we should be proactive and preempt some of the things that would lead mm. to that disaster. It's costly and it's taxpayers' mm. money that's being paid. People think government mm. has got a lot of money. This money should be channeled into things mm. that are essential. Mm. But also it's very embarrassing. I mean, you look at the public protector thing, I don't want to drag mm. it into this. Uh, yeah, she's lost credibility. State totally. of uh, things mm. that are mm. overturned by the court you lose credibility. Mm. The ANC will lose serious credibility seriously if mm. people go to court and win against legislation that's mm. passed mm. by the ANC, mm. uh, legislation that is illegal, really. Mm. Mm. So my interest really is that we find a way of communicating with the mm. ANC leadership. I, I'm, I admit the bias, mm. but also I think it's not mm. in conflict with my interests as a South African. Well, you declared it openly, yeah. and, and do, do they listen to you? We, we, we should keep knocking. <laughs> we have no entitlement to be heard, mm. to, be, to be heard indeed. But we really have to save... Of course, if the ANC fails totally, then, then they, they should be removed from government. Mm -hmm. We should be removed from government. But I believe that right now, in the history of this country, an ANC that is doing right is in a much better position than any of the political parties that I yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, I think if they got to government, we would just be plunged, mm -hmm. in the short term anyway, into mm -hmm. some serious problems. So, one must make sure that the ANC goes back to do the right thing. Mm. 
And, and, and we're really at a point now where we already asked the people who thought we were corrupt to give us the last chance. And they said, mm. we will give you the last chance. And the last chance is not for the ANC to just stay in power. Mm. It's for the ANC to do the things that the founding fathers of this organization mm. established the organization mm. to achieve. Mm. We have to do that. And mm. one of the things in respect of what we're talking about is to really get the ANC people not to feel guilty that they've already passed legislation, to, to, to think with mm. their consciences mm. and say, we were not aware of the damage that's being mm. pointed out. We, we must open up, we must open up channels of communication between that mm. type of people who were in the meeting yesterday, who really have done their work. And these are ordinary people, by the way, some of whom have lost relatives mm. because of this kind of uh, power that's given to mm. traditional leaders. Mm. Uh, you know, where somebody told us about a person mm. who's uh, mm. daughter, was it a son, mm. had to be exhumed mm. and, and kept all because of the power, the enormous power that comes from mm. uh, this setup. And so the, the ANC must realize the error that it has committed mm. and really move. And yeah. move. don't want to put them in the defense, they've already done this thing. You may not they agree are. with that. I'm not sure it, it matters whether I agree or not, but <laughs> when, when Nicholas was interviewing uh, Sezonke in that Voices from <laughs> Africa, uh. he asked her about having been very much a daughter of the ANC and experienced that communalism yeah, yeah. and all those wonderful yeah, yeah. values yeah, yeah. that even though she moved from one country to the next and never had a home like what Egypt, did she, say? <laughs> she said to try and save the ANC is to destroy South Africa's prospects. She thought, she thought that it was, that the effort needed to be channeled elsewhere to try and somehow build okay. and, and open up spaces. That's her father now speaking. Yeah. She's written off the ANC a long yeah. time ago. Mm. And unfortunately, she seems to be right. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't stop challenging wrong, wrongdoing because mm. when you stop, you don't remain stationary. You slide, you slip, mm. it mm. goes down. So you continue fighting even if you're not going to win. Mm. <laughs> because uh, mm. at least you remain stationary until other forces come in and maybe... Mm. It, it's, it's not the ANC for its sake. Mm. We really are in a serious mm. problem in this country. Honestly, I mean, when you look at the TA, as I said yesterday, mm. Which just doesn't seem to understand that South Africa has got black people in the majority, <laughs> and and it's mm. a majority of them in the DA who must represent people in parliament. Mm. Uh, if you have got an EFF yeah. like Ma Malemas, which thinks that it can terrorize people, continue to be thieves, how do those people come into government? Until maybe the youth mm. comes up and mm. says, "You've tried and failed." Uh, and I don't know in what mm. frame they would be coming. Mm. Uh, you know, when you talk to Frank Chikane's son, you know, you can see the anger. He's written mm. a book. Uh, mm. it, it's, it's you guys, thank you very much. We like you, Simon, and so on. Mm. But, but you can't make it allow young people now. We mm. will step in and try and fix this thing. Mm. Can I draw a parallel, which is mm. a... It takes back what I'm really about as well as a, I happen to still be a Catholic... Mm. Uh, and have a, a sense of having grown up in that. And my identity is in the Catholic Church. Right. My children are a bit like how Sazonke feels about the ANC. Yeah. They feel about the Catholic Church for very good reason. I mean, look at the dreadful scandal that we've seen mm. in the Catholic Church with the wholesale abuse, uh, sexual abuse, and how that systemic, terrible... Oh, I mean, it's unimaginable to me when we are growing up, and I'm sure when you were in command of mission, you know, being educated by these Catholic nuns, the fact that this church could have produced such mm. terrible things. I have found, paradoxically, that there, is a, there are spaces opening up, but it does mean that <laughs> one does have to be uh, ready to um, basically swim against the stream. You know, because yeah. as you know, Malcolm Margaret, you said only dead fish swim with the stream. So where do we see yourself I going would, upstream? I, I, I wouldn't stand 
in the way of a progressive alternative mm -hmm. to find if there is a viable way of solving our problems I would be part of that mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and I haven't discovered it as I said a little earlier you've got uh, young people who are really serious mm -hmm. who, who just think that uh, I think like Sisonke we are beyond the pale now that's, that's really what they mm -hmm. think I'm of the view that uh, we have indeed been captured as an organization by extremely greedy people, by people of venal, people who really, a, a mm. politician is not really a swear word. When we grew up, it was a person who wanted to do good for the community, take power mm. and redistribute it properly. Mm. Unfortunately, there has been a high level of infiltration into mm. the leadership of our organization, of people who don't take view mm. politics in that manner. By the way, there are lots of good people in the ANC, perhaps mm. not at leadership level. They have drifted out of the party mm. without resigning from it mm. and done other things and forgotten about politics. When you talk to them, they really know what the values of mm. an ethical organization mm. are and they would really mm. join efforts Mm. to bring this about. Uh, but then it's uh, about getting those people, not just into the ANC, but the people in the state. And the National Prosecuting Authority has been so eviscerated, but there is still some people there holding on, you know. I yes. think of Billy Hoffman. You know, so there is a sense in which the state instruments are seemingly kind of now getting back into place. Very slow. Maybe we've there's got to be some sort of spark of renewal within the ANC you to know, purge you know, its ranks of people that really have no commitment to the values of the country. John, you can keep this for your record, may not be for this interview. The statement that came out of the ANC NEC mm. yesterday mm. is a lot different than the ones that have been issued by Ace Mahashule's office in the past, mm. in the past year or so. It's clear that people sat down and said, this statement will be drafted by a group of people. Mm. The fact that this uh, issue of Derek Hanekom, for instance, mm. is being referred to the National Working Committee, mm. that is one structure that is the reformist people. Uh, it? I bet you, I bet you, the Derek Hanekom thing is likely to be just dismissed. Mm, okay. Likely. But okay. I, I, I may be wrong. Mm. I am saying there are these forces that we should seek and find mm. in the ANC. Uh, mm. I just don't know why people are so afraid of stepping forward. The majority of people did vote for, for, mm. for Cyril Ramaphosa. So he has a majority, however thin, in the NEC. What perplexes me and other mm. people is why they are not active in defending their gains mm. in, in Nazareth. Uh, normally, even the pro-Zuma people in the past would have been pro-Zuma because they had some benefit, either corrupt uh, mm. acquisitions uh, mm. or protection of a job when you're incompetent. Mm. Mm. He's gone now. He's no longer able to offer that uh, kind of, um, mm. uh, what do you call it, um, mm. those, those, those privileges. Mm. There is no reason for these people to stay with him. So there must be tactics mm. used to actually budge bar them. And I'm not talking about the ANC relative to other things. The ANC in itself, even if it were to be defeated in the next elections, must become a better organization than what it mm. is now. Mm. Even if... Maybe that's what will do it. Even if it must form mm. a good opposition party. There, mm. There's nothing sacred about running mm. government. There's mm. nothing shameful about being mm. in the opposition. In the world today, there are coalition governments. Mm. You might end up with a coalition of mm. people who, which, which acts mm. much stronger than this mm. thing. I, I'm, I'm not so married mm. to ANC being in power mm. alone. I, I wish mm. it could be like that when I look at the opposition mm. today. But um, if you got a group of people, mm. of parties, who were going to run this country decently mm. and respect the people and do all the things mm. that we all thought democracy was about, 
I wouldn't mind what the title mm. of that organization <laughs> was. And in the meantime, I have to say, by the way, that I'm only speaking to you now thanks to a certain person who shall remain nameless, mm. who works in the Thule house, who gave me your contact details. Really? <laughs> he oh, said, interesting. when I was really concerned for Queen Lombokisa Sikau and yeah, the yeah. situation that she was facing about yeah. being deposed by the, and being sort of treated so shabbily and badly in terms of having served the Amampondo as traditional leader but been cast aside. Terrible. I got that. hold of somebody uh, who I happen to know. Yeah. And so there are people there who are working to but try John, to stay... But John, we are assembled here if you still have tape. Back to these bills. Mm. It's important mm. to get the ANC to change its mind mm. in a manner that perhaps doesn't embarrass them as long as the result is not mm. the ANC embarrassing mm. itself by passing bills for short-term gains. These mm. bills mm. will be defeated when people challenge them mm. in, in the courts. By the time that happens, we will have lost so much money, mm. so much time, and so much suffering would have continued and, and increased. And potentially lives. And, 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 and lives. That's what they call a many. There are now four people that yeah, I know being absolutely. killed because of Ab that mining. This is really the message that one would like to take across to the mm. ANC. And I'd say, guys, you've been stupid. You've allowed these things to say, guys, think about it. I don't think you are aware of what you are doing. I really mm. think mm. you aren't. I would really like to find a way of getting the conversation. The mm. conversation of yesterday was impressive. Mm. Ordinary people are not talking about experts. Uh, and there were some good experts there. I mean, Aninka is a wonderful human being, <laughs> heart in the right place. She's got the intellectual understanding of the problem. But, you know, the ANC must be exposed to this. I was asked three weeks mm. ago to talk to the uh, members of the provincial legislature, and I thought it was a wonderful thing about ethics, you know, mm. about integrity. People must ask those people, mm. uh, the ANC leaders, must have the courage to expose themselves to the people who were talking at the mm. meeting at the Mandela Foundation yesterday to find out a little more about this mm. thing. They will be surprised at how the knowledge is shared without any bombast and any, mm. any, anything. They will be educated. Good. Well, you've given me my works now cut out for me. I could go on listening to Mavusam Samang. <laughs> because he's such a good listener, he lets me kind of say a lot of what I believe. But it's so nice to actually see the thoughts which have been germinating, being echoed back from somebody of his particular integrity. And what he's done for me, a, a friend of mine once gave me a quote, which I thought was a lovely one to end with. He said, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. Wow. So let's see if that happens. Um, I'm going to be presenting on my channel the, all the various uh, presentations from the yesterday. And I hope that uh, you give feedback. You know, YouTube is an excellent platform. You can give comments. We want this to be a dialogue, not just simply a propaganda exercise. And thank you so much, sir, for your generous time. John, may I thank you also <laughs> for the opportunity. You know, my thoughts were crystallizing as we were talking because what we both want to achieve is justice mm. for the ordinary people. Yes. And I think sometimes people who do wrong are nudged back when you say to them, you may not have been aware of this. Mm. It's, it's not quite right. Because, you know, when you budget them, and they become very defensive mm. and so on. Mm. But I mean, really. Mm. Interesting. Mm.